Hello, everyone. Sorry for the late start. <clears throat> How's everyone's day? Mine has been busy. I am not at home right now. I'm actually in the department because I've had to be here all day. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. But I'm glad that yours is going well, Tyler. Um... all right <clears throat> welcome everyone oh this is not where i want to start this is here we go all right welcome everyone we are in <clears throat> week six so and we're going to be talking about contemporary artists from south korea and we're going to be thinking about how they relate to this idea of tradition. Um, so I don't have any announce, I don't have like an announcement slides or anything like that. But uh, next week, remember, is our last week of plenary session. Um, it is the last week for uh, the blog and the uh, after class assignment. Um, I think I need to make that actually. I, cause, um, Normally, in the past, it had been doing the final next week, but we're going to start the final is going to be um, Monday, March 4th is when it's going to open. So that's two weeks from now. So uh, we don't have much left. This class goes really quickly. Um, and uh, remember, we'll have um, on March 5th from noon to 1 p.m. Uh, that's the Tuesday of week eight. The last week, we'll do the live session, um, an in-person se session with me at the Spencer Museum of Art. Remember also, um, so remember that's extra credit. It's not required. Uh, remember, you're also allowed to go do the extra credit assignment yourself um, in the museum if you cannot attend the uh, live session with me. So are there any questions about... Uh, the final assignments or the last few weeks of class or anything like that? The last couple weeks? I think it's pretty self-explanatory, right? But you never know. All right. Sorry, I need to set my watch. Here we go. Yes, good question, Callie. So I'll talk about the final next week, but it is the same uh, structure, same format as the midterm. So now that you're really familiar with what you're, what, with what it looks like. Uh, the final is actually usually for students easier than the midterm. Not always, but usually. Good question though. All right, so let's talk about these, these uh, terms here. This is the attendance question for today. What is contemporary as opposed to modern, as opposed to traditional, right? So this is a very, <laughs> kind of poorly um, structured question, but basically why do we have, we have these three different words here, right? Contemporary, modern, traditional, and especially the two words that get thrown around almost synonymously are contemporary and modern. So what do you think? What are the differences? What do they each individually mean? How would you define them individually? Why do we have all three of them? And all three of them exist in um, Korean as well. There are three different words for these. So what do we think? All right, Claire is the first one in here here. So contemporary is like our lifetime mm, and modern is like 100 years, the last, the previous 100 years. And then traditional is like the roots of the culture, right? Or the roots of tradition. Yeah. So yeah, contemporary is like, um, 
in, you know, we live in the contemporary, right? Modern, we kind of live in the modern. Um, in, in the 21st century, we do kind of, but it's also kind of more like, uh, there's still a little bit of distance from us who are right now and with modernity maybe, right? We live in modernity, but not necessarily um, in the process of modernizing, right? So modern <laughs> is like function, Callie says. Traditional is like culture, contemporary, aesthetic. Okay, this is interesting. So um, maybe thinking about what the three terms indicate in concerning like art, right? So modern might be like the art is functional, contemporary art is more about aesthetics and traditional is about like art is reflecting of the culture of a people, right? Oh, good, Alpha. Yeah. So each word, there's some there's some sense of transition that each word uh, indicates here. This is very good to notice, right? There's some um, in each and all three of them, there's this sense of change that's happening. But the change that's happening might be different, right? Exactly. That's a really good point to bring up. And I think that is relevant here for sure. Okay, so good. Tyler says modern... <laughs> So thinking about their relationship, right? So modern is kind of like different or newer than traditional. And then contemporary is like even more recent. And then traditional is definitely like that older or long lived, well established um, kind of thing, right? Good, Daphne, yeah. So <clears throat> you'll have to excuse me today. I'm, I'm having a bit of a cough. So contemporary is more like right now and then modern is more like the recent past yeah that's very good and then tradition is something that's older in history yeah that's definitely kind of how i personally define them um so maddie oh very interesting so um contemporary is definitely present but the modern is kind of like this general time period um especially that is recent history and kind of envelops the present too um but it's not necessarily denote denoting a specific um um you know like the 20th century only but it could be this kind of periodization in time right good um let's see yeah, so tradition, I'm seeing a lot of traditions are like the fundamentals, the roots, the kind of the beginning and modern and kind of evolves from it. Um, Fatima says traditional using old mediums. Yeah, so we think of things that are more old, like older things that were common in older times that aren't common anymore necessarily as traditional usually. So, um, and that could be, as Fatima gives us here, clothing, jewelry, pottery, things like that. Modern, overall recent, um, and then contemporary is current. Yeah, that's a good word to put too, current for contemporary. Yeah, okay, good. Hunter is about the same thing. I'm going to look and see if we have anything um, different here. Oh, okay, Elsa. Thank you. So modern and traditional are kind of like the opposites of, of each other, right? Um, traditions take place over hundreds of years and modern is more recent, like the like past 100 years maybe, when modernization takes place. Exactly, yeah. And the contemporary is at this point. Very good. Good. I'm seeing a lot of the same thing here. So I think I'm going to try and move on. I'm going to look one really quick. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of different ways you can talk about this. And I'm sorry if I didn't quite get to your um, to your comment here, but they, they all, I, I see what's going on. Um, I think they're all hitting, hitting uh, the spot here that we want to be thinking about. So contemporary definitely refers to like right now, very recently. Um, especially the late 20th to 21st century. So it depends on who you talk to when contemporary starts exactly. Um, but it definitely is the 21st century we think of as contemporary um, because that is definitely our lifetime. But um, 
it could also encompass like some people even think just the entire post World War II is contemporary art, or well, contemporary times, right? Not everybody agrees with that, but some people do. So late twentieth century is um, a really common kind of time period time frame for the contemporary. Now, a lot of you, and I really like this, you're thinking about the qualities of what society is like, what the art is like, what is going on in, in the history and politics at this time, right? Because that's also important. And that's part of why we have different words for these things, right? So contemporary is very much linked, um, and especially when we talk about art, linked to globalization. So this idea of the world being fully globalized, everyone is um, intersecting with each other. Um, the national boundaries are much more um, fluid. There's a lot more of this kind of exchange of ideas and culture itself looks more similar between countries than it has ever before is kind of this idea behind what is really the quality of contemporary. And that really does kind of start to happen really through World War II and after, right? Um, and then in the case of Korea, particularly, we think about post-colonialism, right? So after they've been colonized by Japan and now they're no longer colonized to, by Japan. Instead, they have these kind of weird um, kind of quasi-colonial neo or maybe neo-colonial relationships with the United States, particularly, which we've talked a lot about with Minjung, right? Um, and then post-democracy as well. So after the military regimes, um, and again, so that's kind of post-Minjung is another word you'll see. And post-industrialized too. So contemporary industrialization, which is a part of modernization, right? That's happened, right? And so now there's kind of this economic standing that Korea has that's really significant, and they consider that a quality of contemporary. Modern is also recent, but definitely not right now, or it's a little bit further away from the right now. And it's for sure the 19th and 20th century, but the exact um, you know years you want to divide it into are a little bit harder. And so modern is globalizing, right? So they're becoming, those connections across countries are starting to form and they are forming through um, modernization, right? Um, and then that's also the era of imperialism and colonialism, especially, right? So um, certain countries such as Japan are imperialist and then certain countries are colonized. And then after World War II, especially, these empires start to kind of break up because most of them didn't really, the World War II especially, really um, weakened them. Um, and this is also the period where industrializing is happening, right? And then tradition. So tradition or traditional. Pre-modern, for sure. So before, <clears throat> before all of these phenomenon of the modern, right, are happening, we think of that as traditional. Um, old also is associated associated with that. But um, what's interesting, though, is that for tradition, um, there are these practices and beliefs or whatever you, you know, the arts have been kind of handed up right into the present from the past and they continue into the present. But when does something become a tradition? What do you think? Who is the one who labels that practice, that belief? that art as traditional or tradition. What do you think? Okay, good, Tyler. So historians, right? Art historians, art historians, artists. Um, you might say the so-called um, experts on it, um, the so-called modern or contemporary experts on something from the past might be the ones who label that traditional, right? Alpha says maybe a founder. So um, maybe someone at the time purposefully wants to start a tradition that they hope will last for um, centuries, right? Or for ge the generations. So maybe they do. 
Um, good. Francis says the repeaters. Right. So the people who start it, maybe they don't necessarily think about it as like a tradition, but then the people who repeat it from the act of repeating it, or even those people who started it when they start repeating it eventually, right? It starts to become viewed as a tradition, right? It becomes a tradition. Um, oh, okay. So maybe uh, as Fatima is pointing out, some big event happens that changes culture or life. And then those things that uh, were the way that life used to be before that event, that's what we call condition or tradition, right? So maybe it's a big event, like a historical event, right? Like modernization, becoming colonized, um, globalizing, right? Um, good. Institution. Very good, Maddie. So institutions like, um, so a community, right? Or a family, um, something like a school, something like a government, something like a, a museum are the ones who decide when it's a tradition and they deem it so. Um, good. Let's see what else. Oh, Travis, I like this way of putting it. New generations that value their culture and continue to pass it on. Good. This is very important here. So people in the in the in the in the present have a they value that thing which comes from the past or is rooted in the past and therefore they give it they endow it with that value of tradition. Oh, this is our tradition. This is traditional. Um it has meaning to us as something that's been passed to us. And therefore, that's that's when it becomes a tradition. That's a really, um, I really like that way of thinking about it. And I think that's pretty accurate. Um, good. Yeah. So, but what I, what to really notice here is that it's, it's something that happens later, right? It's not really something, um, it could be something theoretically that an artist did or a group of people did. And they said, we want to continue doing this. We want this to become a tradition. But in reality, something becoming tradition happens retrospectively, right? It comes through that repetition. Um, and this is something that we do and uh, we really appreciate it. And therefore it is our tradition. Good. Yes, exactly, Hope. So maybe it's been repeated over time and then an institute like the government picks up on that, right? And then it becomes like what we discussed last week, part of national identity, right? Which is a lot of what we were talking about last week with quote unquote, traditional Korean art. So that happens in retrospect. So let's talk about contemporary art or art after the 1990s. So, or art after Mingjung is another thing you'll hear in Korea. So according to the reading by Charlotte Horlick, how is the art that starts popping up and happening in the 90s different from art that was happening earlier, say, Minjung art, art during the Japanese colonial period? Um, how is that? How is it different from that art? There's, I found two ways. And I'll tell you, it's right on the it's right on the first page. It's right in the first paragraph, actually. She's very explicit about it. Yes, good. Good. So Kyle says it's far less politically charged. Yes. So it is political, but there's a nuance to the politics that's different from Minju. And I think Claire has it here. Focused on the individual and their role in larger society than some call to action, right? Very good. So it's a politics that's focused more on the individual and what they believe, rather than, for example, a political movement like the Minjung movement, right? Exactly. So good. So think about that and take that with the fact that, as Hope points out here, um, and Maddie also does too, um, diversity, pluralism. It's an age of pluralism, which Horlick says. Um, and so think about how the individual and this diversity um, start to coincide and develop with each other. And as Maddie puts, now the art has a variety of interpretations, right? Because of the, the political kind of ambiguity about this art and its diversity, um, it's the meaning behind it can be also individual. 
It can also be diverse. It can be, quote unquote, in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, good. So Elsa brings up there's this movement towards meaningless art. Yes, some artists want to make art that is specifically just purely aesthetic um, or art that is kind of, as, as you're saying, you know, it doesn't it doesn't mean anything. It just was cool, right, that they made it or they just wanted to do something. Good. Um, yes, more focused on, as Jimin puts it, the artist, the way the artist sees the, the world. Exactly. They put a lot of their um personal interpretation of the world into it, right? Yeah. So those are the two things that I put too. I could I should have put individualism as well in this um in this second bullet point here. But yeah, so the diversity of media, right? I don't think did anyone put diversity of media? So there's a lot more, and you know, there's not just painting anymore. Um and it's not just the woodblock prints that we've seen. But we're going to start seeing, and we're going to talk about today, performance art, um, installation art, uh, site-specific sculpture, things like that, right? This is a little bit more complex than just a painting in a lot of ways. Paintings can be very complex, um, but understanding a painting, usually you can look at it and kind of figure it out. But then now there's a lot more of this embodiment going on with the art, right? So why why these changes? Why, what is Horlick saying there's reasons for these changes? And we've really talked about all the reasons the past few weeks in this course. There's one big reason and there's kind of a secondary reason. Yes, Hunter, so the government changes in Korea. How? How does the government change? So yeah, the big thing is Daphne, Claire, Ian... Um, Tyler, uh, Truman, right, um, Hunter, it's no longer dictatorship, right? It's democratic. There's a lot more freedom now. So the the Minju movement succeeded. They brought about some sense, they brought about democracy, right? And they also brought about much uh, a freedom of speech. We'll talk about this a little bit more next week with K-pop, but censorship was huge, as we've kind of seen. Um, and one of the things that Minjung was fighting against in the 1990s, censorship becomes, uh, it really uh, diminishes, right? Good. So there's this political change. And then it's particularly, Horlick keeps saying this. She doesn't define this in this chapter. She actually defines it in the chapter before, but you didn't necessarily need to know it. It's actually not that big of a deal. But it's it's the fact that there's this generation, this specific generation of incoming um, artists and just individuals, adults, middle-aged adults, who experienced this change. They were the actants in Minju, um, or their friends were the actants in Minju, right? So they're called the 386 generation or Sampai And all it means is that they were born in the 60s of age in the 80s. So they were going to college in the 80s. And then they're in their 30s and the 90s. So they were in their kind of um, prime adult phase, which is we tend to think of as like the 30s um, during this immediate post-democratized period, right? Um, so that's kind of, it's kind of this combination of, of factors here. So this is the hard part. What is Har Horlick's assumption about art before the 1990s then? So she's saying that art at the 1990s starts to diversify. Um, it's not linked to political movements anymore. There's more individual expression. So what is she assuming about the art before the 90s? Right, Claire, yeah. So the art is all, it's not It's not necessarily all, but it's there's a politics behind the art. Um, good, Ian, it has a smaller scope. I like that, Ian. It's um, a much more um, narrow what art can be prior to this time. Um, it has to be linked, if it is political, it has to be linked to a specific um, a specific movement or call to action. Um, and so what she's really talking to here is what's called a canon that we have in South Korean art. And unfortunately in eight weeks, we can't go over all of the canon, um, but we are hitting some good points in the canon here. Um, so what is a canon? 
I say I was a canon of art, what am I saying? What am I referring to here? Okay, so a shared history slash story and chain of events. Okay, we're getting on the right track here. Um, there's a little bit of a nuance to canon, though. Sudden surge and change, not quite, but canons do tend to consider that. Um, timeline, we're almost there. Kind of getting to it. Still a reality. No. Let me think here. Ah, uh, here we go. Elsa, I, I, I thought you would, you would be able to explain this pretty well. So look at what Elsa has said here for us. A canonical artwork is an artwork that is seen as representing the ideal artwork for that country or time period. Exactly. This is a very um, detailed way of putting it. And Daphne puts it that way too. And Hope says it even simpler as well. So iconic artworks represent a certain period. Hope says standard. Yeah. So a canon is like this group of artworks or it could be um, literature. It could be stories. It could be um, scholarship as well that are for whatever reason viewed as the, the archetype of a time period or of a culture. And so what Horlick is doing here is she's kind of iterating that there's a specific canon of artwork prior to the 1990s, such as Minjung art. And this, which we never talked about, unfortunately, but it was mentioned briefly. And this is what Minjung art was fighting against, was that, quote unquote, apolitical art for art's sake, which is in the 1970s abstract painting. Um and this is an example of one of those. You don't need to know anything about this. But what she's assuming here is that because this is the canon, if you read an art history book like Charles Horlick's book about South Korean art um, after the after World War II, in 1990s are going to or 1970s are going to focus on this kind of art, abstract painting. So the question remains: Do you think that the canon really can represent or does? become representative of all the art during a time period. What do you think? Ooh, Kyle, nice, nice phrase here. Counterculture, counterculture. Yeah, not always. It, there's not always. The canon is definitely important and there's a reason it exists. But there are always exceptions to the canon, and that comes in the counterculture, um, what goes against the grain or what goes against what's popular at a time, right? And yeah, like Tyler says, there's just no way, and I Claire's also saying that and hope, there's no way that you can fully represent or um, qualify all of the art that occurs in a period, right? So... The things that Charlotte Horlick doesn't talk about here or mention, even though she starts talking about these genres of art in the chapter, she doesn't talk about these in her book at all either. Um, even if we were to read her her um, chapters that are about the 60s and 70s particularly, um, she doesn't mention these at all. But there was performance art. There were counterculture artist groups, such as this group called the Union Exhibition of Young Artists in the 1960s, who they did performance art. They called it happenings or happening. They called it happening. But they were doing things that were quite similar to what we're going to look at today. And then there was also artistic photography or art photography, fine art photography, you might hear, um, that was also very politically charged. Um, a lot of the time it was printed in newspapers. But um, but photography as a medium, as even earlier than the 1970s, it, during the Japanese colonial period, it was definitely being used as well as this kind of artistic rather than just purely journalistic. We usually think of journalism, journalistic art photography, um, which is just trying to capture a moment, um, which is what a lot of art photography does, but also with an attention to aesthetic and the storytelling as well. So... These genres, these new media that um, Horlick talks about, they actually do have deeper histories in Korea. Uh, but unfortunately, she just doesn't mention it. 
So it's just important to think about that when you're reading a text, you know, what are the assumptions that this person is making? Um, they might be conscious or subconscious. And um, this is one of them for that text. So <clears throat> we're going to focus on two contemporary artists today and kind of shift back towards thinking about tradition here. Um, and we're going to be talking about Ipur and Sado Ho, both of whom are artists that you will see as representative of Korean art on the international stage, which is why we are focusing on them. And our question that we're going to think about is, how do these contemporary artists relate to tradition through their work? So starting with Ipur. So this is Ipur's um, performance piece called Sorry for Suffering. You think I'm a puppy on a picnic. Um, she did this in 1990, over 12 days. Um, and it was during um, a, a, a big arts festival in Tokyo, actually. Um, and she goes to these different places. Um, Gimpo Airport is in Southern Korea, Southern South Korea is in, in Gimpo, um, which is kind of close to Busan. Uh, she also goes to Narita, the Narita Airport, which is the Tokyo Airport. She goes to downtown Tokyo, a theater in Tokyo. And she does this. So what is performance art? What is the kind of art that uh, Ipur is kind of making in this case? Um, kind of creating. What's the art that he is creating here? Ooh, good, Maddie. Yeah, so going back to the idea happening, like I said. So like they used to call performance art in Korea in the 60s, in the 60s and 70s, happening. Happening. Yes, yeah, so it's something that is, act, it's live. So it's the person creating something and it's live. It's happening in that moment, right? Very good. Um, the artist is an active participant in the art. Yeah, um, the artist you can kind of always think as an active participant, but their participation in the in the process, right, is what's important. And Claire says it puts on a show. Yeah, there's this kind of show or spectacle aspect to it, right? Um, good, Tyler. Yes, it's the her, the experience of the art. The experience is what's the important part. The art is the experience, right? And so it's in, into, um, and that experience is created through uh, her performance, what she's wearing, where she is, who is watching, right? Ian, temporal art. Yes, temporality is very important to it. Um, Callie, a demo. Yeah, um, you can think of, you can think of a single um, instance of a performance piece as a demo of it, right? That's good. Um, okay, Cade, thank you for bringing this up. So it's when a person is part of their own art, right? But it's still different from a play or a drama. Why is it different? What do you think? Ooh, okay, Alpha, you just answered my question kind of. So a performance artist is different, I think, from theater. Um, although it can be theatrical and related to theater. And so Alpha brings up aesthetics, there's something more about the aesthetics to it, right? So the way that it looks, the visual is more important to it, perhaps. Maybe. What else? Why else is it different? Ian, it doesn't have to have a narrative. Yeah, not necessarily, right? Um, you know, usually you can kind of think of the piece as in and of, of itself, being the narrative, but it's not necessarily telling the story in the same way that a theater theater would. Okay, so maybe a snap a snapshot. Oh, keep that idea of snapshot it with you. Yeah. Good. So yeah, you can define performance art in a lot of different ways, but what's important about performance art is what the artist is doing. And it's that experience, um, that activity of it. Um, and that is uh um, influenced by where they are, who's watching, the audience is very important to performance piece. Uh, and then what actions they've decided to take, what they're wearing, um, are all what they're using is all important to that aspect of doing. But think about it as the art is the action, right? So what's kind of difficult about studying this? A difficult about studying performance art and trying to understand performance art. And be thinking about how are we going to look at it 
look at and try and understand E's for, for sorry for your suffering performance. Claire, yes. You have to see it live. Ian, you you can't have actually experienced it. Yeah, exactly. Yes, very good. So if the art is the experience of the action, if you're not someone who personally experiences it, you have to kind of piece it together, right? Um, through something like what Tyler says, a video. Um, or someone who someone else who actually personally experienced it. Um, a recording of it. Or in this case, unfortunately, there's not a recording of this performance. 12 days she did this and there's no um, video, at least public video recording that I can personally find. Instead, we have to rely on piecing together photographs, right? Um, we could also interview the artist, right? And so what Alpha brings up here, very good. And I think, yes, and Hope brings up here too is because we're viewing it through a photograph, there's this potential for kind of error, you might say, in study because a photograph doesn't necessarily capture like the full breadth of um, what's going on in it. It's only a moment in time. So we can't necessarily see everything and study it. Uh, we kind of have to rely on just these moments in time. And photographs are subjective, exactly. Like um, they are through the lens of the photographer, right? Or through the, photo the, the camera itself. So there's a lot of these different layers. And so these performances can't necessarily be the same twice as well. So even if it's something that gets repeated, it's going to be different every time. So I bring this up because this is what we have to use to try and do our visual analysis, right? And so when we're describing a performance, there's a couple of different questions that, and aspects that we want to um, think about when we're describing it that are different from what we've done so far. So let's try these questions together. So what is Lee doing? This very simple question, but it can be very hard to kind of describe. Um, but the first thing you want to think about is the action. So what do you think? What is Lee doing? What is Ipur doing in this? Okay. Standing on a street corner. Good. What else? Dancing, maybe? Yeah. Or waving her arms, maybe? Yeah, exactly. Waving her arms. Uh, she's wearing a costume. Very good, Ian. Um, Francis, she's taking up space. Yeah, she's very much in this space. Uh, right? Good. Um, where is she? Where is Lee? Tokyo. Yeah, this one is, I'm pretty sure is just in downtown. This is on a street, a street corner in downtown Tokyo. Very good. Near a bus stop, possibly. Um, I think this is a crosswalk sign here to the back left, but yeah, in a public area at least, right? Yeah. Um, who or what else do you see? What is kind of the environment that she's in? Who else is there? What else is there? Good. Some businessmen, right? Some bystanders. Yeah. Pedestrians, cars. There's lots of cars, lots of traffic here. Um, yeah, just average everyday people, you might say. Um, it seems like a very busy environment. That's good. Good. A, a good to, to kind of use some more abstract adjectives like busy um, to describe the environment. Good. So now this is something that it's a little bit interpretive, but it is important to the description. How do the artist and the audience seem to feel, react, respond, think? What is kind of their relationship to each other? What is the relationship between the artist and the audience? Okay, Alpha says curious. Who is curious? Remember to be, when you're dealing with multiple people, remember to be specific who you think it is. So the men seem confused and intrigued. Yeah. So they're kind of looking at her, right? So you might want to say they're kind of looking at her. Um, let me add that in here. And what makes you say that this is their relationship? What makes you say that they seem to feel, react, or respond, right? So they're kind of looking at her uh, from a distance, right? Um, and they seem kind of like they are 
their faces don't necessarily show like they know what's happening or what's going on here. Um, let's see what else we have here. Surprised or confused. Yeah, maybe they their faces kind of they're frowning maybe um, or they're just kind of looking. I think like this guy back here, he kind of has like a not again like this again, kind of like another weirdo on the street. Maybe look about him. Um, yes, good. And then Jimin, the artist does not acknowledge them, right? She's not looking at them at all. She is not actually trying to engage them, it seems like. Um, she's kind of looking down, almost kind of like burying herself in her costume, right? Good. <clears throat> and um, let's see what else. So maybe she seems kind of discomforted, right? Good. Oh, good, Elsa. Yeah, so notice the audience especially. They still seem to be in motion, right? Elsa brings this up. They still are trying to go about their regular every day. They're just doing that, um, moving around, right? Crossing the street. Um, exactly. Let's see. What else we have? Yeah, exactly. Good. I think these are all great things that you should you would you should state, right? In your des your description here of like what's going on. But then there's this kind of second layer, particularly to E's performance, and that's this. Very interesting costume, right, that she's wearing. So notice I didn't ask you to describe anything about that. Kind of wanted to give you a better, more close-up picture of what's kind of going on with this. So this is a little bit more, this is a little bit similar to what we've done in the past here. So kind of in general, how would you, what does it look like? What is its like shape, um, its shape in particular? What are some things you would say to try and get someone to think about what this, this is that she's wearing um and try to be specific try to be specific sorry maybe i should have uh said, think about the shape in particular oh okay good here we got some good we got some good good ones here so organic it has this very organic and mangled shape right crustacean-esque yeah it kind of looks like a crab or a lobster in some way right um bodily very good yes it has this very it's very abstract but it's very bodily right um it kind of has this sense of flesh and muscle to it good here claire brings it up here the limbs very important here to be specific right there are all these limbs coming off of this central um the central body right so and it look maybe it looks like crab meat a little bit or something um it is humanoid, right? There's something about it that's humanoid. What about it? Um, what do you notice about these limbs? Um, there's a lot of them. What about the shape of the limbs? What do you notice is on them? There are many different sizes, Jimin points out. Very good. Um, hands, yes, the hands and the palms, right? Some of them have these hand-like shapes on them. I think like this one over here, it's just kind of more like, how would you describe this? It doesn't have a hand on it, but what would you say about this? A limb, there's some other words. I think I saw um, appendage. I think it was another, there's another, there's a word that I came up with particularly. A stump, intestine, ooh, yes. Um. Yeah, there's no, very good. Yeah, there's no perceivable sense of where they're located on the body. That's very good. It's, it's that abstract. You can't really tell where they're coming from. Good, yeah. So I said like tentacles and many students in the past have said it's very tentacular. Like there's a lot of kind of like tent tentacles coming off of it, these appendages. Um, but yeah, it's important to notice that some of them have the hands, right? And that really helps us connect it to its flesh-like, as we said. Um, it's kind of like a monster, it's bodily. I like this. It's um another word. I didn't put this here is abnormous. Have you heard this term before? Abnormous means that um it doesn't have any sense of of a comprehensible shape to it, right? It's just it's very kind of um this hodgepodge of of shapes. So the medium. Some of us started bringing this up. Um, I heard I uh, read textiles somewhere. What else would you say about the media? Media. There's a couple different media going on here. A couple different media. And this is in the caption in um or um Korlek talks about it at least. 
So you might need to remember, but I think you can get a good a good look at what's going, what kind of media were used in making this costume. Good padding, padding, um, padding or foam, you can say. So padding just refers to something that is um, maybe you have some fabric and then you stuff it with foam. That's the padding, right? So you can stuff fabric with anything, really. Um, but padding is usually foam. And then you sew that up, right? You stitch that up to create the shape. Um, and then you put stuff on top of it, right? And so we have sequin. Claire says sequin. So do you notice these kind of shapes here? They're they're kind of like these sparkly sequin, right? Um, yeah, so this kind of lumpiness that you see, that's from that foam or padding that someone sewed um, together. Um, and so, yeah, those are kind of the two big ones here. Um, okay, let's see. Da, 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 da. Good question. Alpha, I'll, I'm going to answer, I'm going to talk about your question in the next slide because it is kind of related. Um, so here you could also talk about the like flesh toned fabric that she used. It might've been linen or it might've been, I'm not sure. I can't, I don't think it's said and I haven't been able to find it. Um, it's just some kind of flesh toned cloth, right? And she decorated with sequins. So those are important things in the foam, right? Important. Okay, so the style. So usually we talk about the colors and whatnot. But what do you think? What are some adjectives essentially that you would use to um, describe this costume? Jarring, yeah. Uncanny, yeah, good. Eye-catching, abstract, fleshy, yeah. I put like, it's kind of a grotesque style, horror style, alien. I think I saw all of those earlier on as well. Sorry, we need, good, yeah, unnerving style, yeah, very unnerving, good. So let's talk about this. Um, what do you think is Lee's message or intent? Um, how would you respond or react as an audience? And do you think that her message gets across? So this is our interpretation here, thinking about that. So Alpha asks, um, would Ebo, when she went to Tokyo, Tokyo to conduct her performance, did Japanese people know? Based on what we've learned so far, I'm interested to know the Japanese population viewed Lee if they knew she was Korean conducting performance art in Japan. So um, she did this as a part of a, um, <clears throat> a festival at the time that was being held in Tokyo. I don't think that anyone was aware she was going to do this. Um, which kind of goes along with her message, right? And I don't think that at the time people were really thinking about, and I don't think she was necessarily thinking about this either, a quote unquote Korea versus Japan dynamic going on here because she did do this in Korea before at the Gimpo airport before coming to do this in Japan. Um, but you know, some people probably are apt or wanting to read some dynamic, you know, she's this Korean woman and goes to Japan and does this, right? And so I think that might go along with some of the messages that you can think of here, right? So what is what is her kind of a message or intent? Yes, good, Tyler. So don't necessarily know what it's supposed to be what the message is supposed to be but um it see it seems like it's something about you know people feel a certain kind of disgust towards others just based on what they look like maybe or the history of how they've been victimized right um and she's trying to kind of bring attention to that sort of politics right um and how the real victims are the ones that they're disgusted by, right? That the people who are kind of marginalized in society are the ones who are the victims, right? Yeah, so Mitchell brings up the quote here that Horlick says, just shock the audience, right? To try and get them to sympathize with that victim victimization that E feels, right? Exactly, shock them into, into, into to feeling sorry for her, maybe. Um... 
Yeah, Ian, to explore kind of how she's been othered through the way that she suffers, right? Um, and you would be, um, it would catch your attention. Yeah, exactly. And she, you think that she effectively displays it, you know. I think a lot of people have different, um, you know, are going to have different reactions to it depending on um, who you are, what you were doing. Yeah, how society treats oddities, right? Good, yeah. Maybe the message would get across. If she's just trying to confuse people, shock people, then she definitely did it, right? Um, let's see here, too. Dysmorphia. Very good to bring up. Um, Gus brings us up with dysmorphia. So maybe um, she's kind of bringing that, that kind of uh, bodily dysmorphia. Maybe she feels and trying to exemplify that um, to, to the audience, right? Good. Let's see. Yeah, absolutely, Travis. So Travis brings up here at the end, reaction is part of the performance. Yeah, exactly. That's what you want, you know, think about it as an artist. You want the audience to be like interested in and in interact with you or engage with you. Exactly. Good. All right. We have to keep moving on because we're a little bit behind. Um, but yeah, so a lot of people say this is kind of like a feminist expression, um, like what a lot of us have talked about here. Um, I should have put this word in here, too. Um, there's this term called abjection, abjection. Um, which is about how certain, especially people who are historically marginalized, they become this kind of disgusting or grotesque figure in the mind of the majority um, or the oppressor, right? And she really, in a lot of her work, she tries to bring attention to that. And so she oftentimes displays her personal experiences at a woman um, and she's trying to critique the society more broadly, right? And this is another performance piece that she did um, at a different performance festival that was about her experience as someone who um, underwent a, an abortion in Korea at a time when it was actually illegal um, in Korea. So what's kind of different about this politics compared to some of the political art we've discussed? What do you think? What's different about this? So about the politics, not the medium, not the art itself, but the politics, the meaning behind it. Good, Kyle. Yeah, you can kind of relate to it no matter where you're from, right? So this is kind of something that almost every society is dealing with, right? Uh, yes, who is the victim and who is the perpetrator is different depending on the society. Um, but it is something that's part of most societies. Yeah. Claire, very good. There's no solution to the problem. She doesn't offer an answer. She raises a lot of questions, right? And she gives you an experience of the question. But she's not like, this is what we need to do to fix it, which is what a lot of, for example, Minjung art was focused on, right? Um, yes, good, Ian. It's not necessarily geared towards um, critiquing the government, right? Um, and, you know, this is, again, this is kind of anyone, I as an individual, our collectives, we're kind of all in a, in a way responsible for this issue in some, at some extent, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's a lot more about her individuality as Fatima brings up. Um, good. And then, yeah, especially the feminist aspect. There is feminist art um, prior to this. Unfortunately, we didn't talk about that either in class, but there is feminist art in Korea, in South Korea. Um, uh, but I think because of that, as Daphne puts, it's more personal. It's definitely very personal. Mean Jing was definitely very personal for a lot of them, but it was also very um, about like this kind of larger um, collective issue, right? And then what does she seem to be saying about tradition then through this art and politics? through her art and politics. What is she kind of, what is her, seems to be her relationship with tradition then in her art? What is she saying about the traditionally, the way that we think about uh, whether it be women or just marginalized people, 
the body, um, relationships between art and audience, artist and audience. What is she kind of saying here? She's not saying anything directly, right? So we've kind of gone over that, right? Her politics is very indirect. But yeah, Alpha, I think so, right? She's trying to um, drive some sense of change, right? Um, she is critiquing tradition in a lot of ways, right? She's pointing how the traditional way we think about these things, it marginalizes people, right? So Hope, yeah, I would say she's definitely in Truman. She's going against tradition, right? She's really trying to break it down, um, break with it, start something, maybe start something new or at least offer questions that can bring about change. Exactly. Good. Okay. So let's try and go through this quickly, hopefully. So um, how, what kind of genre do you think is Sado Ho? We're going to switch over to Sado Ho here. Um, what kind of genre is fabric architecture? How would you, what, how would you kind of categorize this? This kind of art that Sodo Ho is really famous for. He does other art than this. Ipur does a lot of other art besides performance as well. Um, but uh, this is kind of very famous here. Installation, textile, very good sculpture, expanded media. Yeah, large scale sculpture, very good. Yeah, good. So just really quickly, um, you can keep putting your ideas in the chat, but I might just kind of move along quickly here. Yeah, all of these things. Um, installation, sculpture, multimedia as well, because it's not um, just the textiles. Uh, we'll see he's using these rods and these particular kinds of, um, of, 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 of rods to hang them, rods for the steel rods for the framing and everything. And then it's also interactive, right? So it's something that sometimes you can walk through it. Um, sometimes you can walk under it. Um, there's this sense of of the audience is able to engage with the artwork beyond simply looking at it, but also kind of moving through it um, in a lot of cases. So let's talk about this artwork here, Gate, which was part of this Seattle Art Museum exhibition. Um, it was made for the Seattle Art Museum, and you should have watched a video about it. So the medium, well, how would you describe the medium? Oh, this font is really small. I need to boost that font. So I'm sorry this font is so small. I'll I'll make it larger for the um PDF. What's the medium? There's a couple of different things you could say here. So the steel rods, right? For the structure and then the fabric that he puts over it. What else? Yes, Claire. The projector. The projector, right? You're projecting something on it. And you're projecting a video, right? Exactly. So the projector is definitely part of it. Concrete, there's no concrete in this. This isn't a real, um, or this isn't a concrete structure. It's purely this like hanging fabric structure. Yeah, good. Um, so the fabric he uses is actually polyester fabric. You don't need to be able to identify that like strictly. He's used different kinds of fabric over time as well. Some of them you'll see, especially the older ones were actually silk, but I'm assuming that was really expensive. So he switched. Uh, but yeah, the raw, the stainless steel rods, the video itself is part of the media that is used for this artwork, right? It's just its own video. And we'll break down the video in just a moment. So the iconography. So what are some of the things that are being um, um, kind of depicted here with this artwork? So it's not like a painting, right? Where you can kind of pinpoint every little thing, but kind of, um, but we can still talk about this, right? Good, Claire. Yes. So the gate is his childhood home, right? And it's in this more quote unquote traditional style, right? Exactly. Exactly. What about the video? Do you remember the video? Did he just pick random, random, you know, images and put them in the video that he wanted to project over the, over the screen and the, and the gate? Or was there something a little bit more specific about it? Images reminiscent of his childhood and hometown. Um, no, not quite. The gate was for sure. Um, and maybe in an indirect way, they were reminiscent. So 
Remember, he picked out specific artworks from their collection. Um, and they were all pre-modern East Asian artworks. So kind of like they were really 19th century and earlier. So 1800s and earlier is what he picked, right? So remember that. That's going to be important here. So that goes along with the fact that he had this kind of traditional style home and gate because these are quote unquote pre-modern or what many will call traditional art forms. Um, uh, we'll look at those in a minute, but remember he specifically picked them out. So the composition, um, interaction, the audience interaction kind of goes along with composition. It's kind of like perspective, right? So how, how would you kind of describe the composition of this and how would the audience interact with it? Good, yeah. So the audience is gonna walk through the gate, right? Just like what's kind of depicted here in the in the image. You can walk under the gate, right? You can walk through it like it is a like a like a real gate. You can walk through it, right? Um and you can, yes, very good, Elsa. And um you can uh You'll be able to see it from many different angles. Exactly. It is a lot like a physical barrier Ian puts. It's like it would probably be like a physical barrier in this space. Yeah, exactly. Good. Yeah. So I said um, the gate is like center of this artwork and the projection kind of goes all around it. Right. Um, you can walk through the gate, but probably to understand the vid video, you would need to look from afar as well. Right. Um, so they're going to have a couple of different um, um uh, perspectives from which you're going to engage with this artwork to really understand it, to really grasp it. And the style, how would you describe um, the color, the line, the, um, let's see, what else? The overall, maybe like the um, pictorialisms, right? Um, of this artwork here. What are some things you would say? Good. Thank you, Claire. Old photo, black and white, muted colors. Yeah, it kind of has this, um, I think if you see it in real life, it just happens that the artworks he picked were kind of black and white and muted. Um, but yeah, it does have that kind of feel to it, especially with the projector, right? It's kind of an old, uh, we don't necessarily think of um, this as like a common way of watching a video anymore right is to put it on a on a white screen but that kind of gives that feel to it right oh very nice Elsa. it seems to like blend in with the wall that it's connected to yeah it seems to almost become a wall in a lot of ways right good hunter yes contemporary and traditional combined yes so he has this kind of contemporary media that he's working with but then he combines it with these, he uses and references these traditional iconographies, um, artworks and things. Um, it feels very fairy tale or magical, yeah. Um, and maybe ephemeral, oh, I like that. Yeah, maybe it feels eph ephemeral, that's kind of through the fabric, right? Oh, the green color, yeah, it looks green here. I wonder if the projection kind of changes its color. I don't know, but yeah, it does look green. So maybe that, um, uh, maybe that relates to like maybe Celadon ceramics, which are known for being green. Yeah. So yeah, so I put like the trans, uh, transparent fabric. Uh, you know, think about how this is supposed to be a recreation of the gate, right? And so he, it's a one. It's supposed to be a one to one, right? So the style is very one to one, maybe, um, uh, or realistic in a way. The video is kind of cartoony a little bit if you watch it. And definitely that mixture of contemporary and traditional. So why these artworks? So what do you notice about these artworks here? So this is from 1610. It's a poem scroll with deer from Japan. This is crows. This is from the early 1600s, probably about the same time as the this very this uh, scroll with deer. 
in Japan. Um, and then this is from the 1800s um, by a Korean artist, a Korean painter, Lee Gongju. And this is a folding screen. This is a folding screen here in the middle. Um, this one here has um, the, um, this is actually a hand scroll. Okay, so themes of nature. What did, um, what did uh, uh, Sodo Ho specifically say he wanted to get at? He wanted to get at something by choosing these artworks. It probably does have something to do with nature. Do you remember what he said specifically? View through someone's eyes. So there definitely is a lot of the nature is definitely common. Identity with the collective. So it is related to that. So he said he wanted to reflect the quote unquote core of Asian art, which is Asian tradition, right? So what does he mean by that? What is, according to this, what is Asian tradition or the core of Asian art? So he said natural depictions of nature. What else was he trying to reflect as Asian tradition, right? What else here? What about the media that he picked, right? Panel screen, folding screens, hand scrolls. Are those common in European and, um, you know, European art that would be more familiar to a North American audience? And they're all ink paintings. Yeah, they're all ink, right? So he specifically chose these kinds of artworks, right, that are, um, number one, they're not all Korean. Some of them are even Japanese. Um, he probably chose some Chinese ones, too. I don't know. But they're all kind of viewed as these forms of artwork that are native or more common in Asia, East Asia particularly, prior to the 20th century, right? So... Um, and then if you study Japanese art, which I'm sure someone, you know, which uh, me, like Elsa and I, we took this class a few, few semesters ago about Japanese painting, the gold, the gold on paper is a quote unquote, very, people view that as a very Japanese thing. And it kind of, it kind of is actually, um, right? So he's really trying to hark um, and, and use these quote unquote traditions that are viewed as very East Asian um, by picking these artworks. All right. So let's interpret this a little bit more. So memory, he's all about memory, right? So he says, what we are is all about memories in the video. So do you agree with that statement? <laughs> what did you think about that statement? And how does his gate um, reflect that, this artwork here, gate? So this is part of the projection too. Unfortunately, there's no official photograph of it. This is from a book, but the projector shows his parents' home and the gate um, behind it at some point in the video. So what do you think? All What we are is all about memories. Ooh, yes. So traditions, right? Yeah, traditions are about memory, right? Traditions are about having that memory and um, taking it with you and um, building off of it, as Elsa puts, and improving upon it, the memories of our past, right? The past kind of lives on as our memory, and many of us feel a, a um, we want to improve upon that past, right? Yeah, you can't really be without a memory, right? Memories is what define us and our experiences. It's how we it's how we interact and engage with our experiences, um, as Ian puts forward here. Yes, exactly. Oh, good, Claire. And it's what makes things feel like home because you kind of have a memory of it, right? Um, you build up those memories of a place and it becomes to feel like a part of you, much like your home, exactly. Um yeah, and so thank you for bringing it back. So like as Sadoho brings it into gate, he's he's trying to evoke that memory that he has of his childhood home and his parents, and he really cherishes that memory, right? 
by doing this one-to-one -one recreation of that childhood home, right? Good. So just to talk a little bit about this kind of quote-unquote traditional Korean house. So um, these are called hanok. So han means Korean and ok means like a dwelling. Uh, it means house. And so hanok are, they are not traditional in the sense that they are one-to-one -one recreations of how people before the 20th century lived. In fact, they're very different from that. But they are inspired by Joseon style elite housing complexes, right? So if you look at the style of this building here, it has this what's called a hip and gable roof that has these ceramic tiles on it. Um, it has this particular kind of bracket system in the roof um, that is also from tr kind of pre-modern, especially Joseon style housing. But it's modernized to fit into an urban setting, especially. So um, in a couple of different ways. Number one, um, they might use brick, as you see in some of these is brick. Um, they used it for some homes um, in the Joseon, but uh, not always. Usually it was a plaster. Um, and uh, it's much smaller. The courtyard here, you'll see, is much smaller. Um, the housing complex is made up of different buildings and they each serve different functions. And they're just kind of connected through this outdoor courtyard. Of course, if you're in an urban setting like Seoul, uh, you don't have a lot of space to have a courtyard. Um, so it's still quite beautiful and they have all this these gardens and nature in it, right? But it's much smaller than how it would have been if it was like a an elite person's house in even the 19th century. So that's kind of the traditional, This that's what a traditional, people think of as a traditional Korean house is this. Um... We have a couple minutes here, so let's talk about this. So he talks about this other artwork too, Blueprint. So what memory was Blueprint evoking? And how is that a little bit different from the memory that Gate was evoking? Do you remember what this one was about here? Stairs to his neighbor. Yeah, so that was the stairs to his upstairs neighbor where his landlord lived. His landlord was his neighbor and he lived in the bottom, which is kind of evoked here, right? And he lived downstairs in Wynn. So that was when he was living in New York. That was his New York home, right? So this is kind of like his memory as an adult, right? And his memory as his childhood of his childhood, right? And notice how one of them is very kind of Korean, Korean or Asian. And this one here is his adulthood. He chooses to represent this very kind of New York style um, apartment, which is very common. I mean, these are very common apartments still today, right? Um, good. We're gonna actually move on. We'll move on to this question here. So, how are Ipur over here on the right and Sadoho's? Interpretations of traditions similar and different from each other. What do you think? Similar and different. Okay, so Ipur is very outspoken about her views on tradition where maybe Sado Ho is a little bit more subtle about it, right? Maybe he's a bit more subtle. I would, I kind of agree with that, right? He's not in your face about it necessarily. So good, Alpha. Yeah, they both reflect their experiences with tradition in some way. Yeah, Kate, neither of them express ideas with traditional art media. Very important here. So neither of them express traditional, you, you know, um, at least they're, they don't, as artists, they don't use or actively work in traditional media, right? Um, good. Very good, Tyler. Yeah, the most basic kind of thing is that Sado Ho, obviously, he's very uh, interested in memory. So he's very reverent. He ends up being very reverent to tradition. I like that word here, reverent. But Lee is very obvious with... Um, trying to go against tradition. She's very actively trying to go against it, right? Um, good, Hope. Yeah, so one is using traditional art and architecture. Maybe taking direct inspiration from it might be a better way to put it because he's not necessarily, 
you know, he's not making um, an ink painting. He's not making this hanul, right? This traditional Korean style home. He's making this kind of fabric architecture that is a recreation of it, right? So he's kind of taking inspiration from it. And then Ipur is definitely more just like commenting on the idea of it, right? Good. Yeah, and then Gage is a little bit more positive about it and personal. Uh, both, I think both are pretty personal, but it's based on his personal memory. And Pur is more, yeah, finds it suffocating, um, like she says. Exactly. Good. All right. So we got to finish up here. So this is your plenary response prompt. It's on Canvas as well. So you're basically going to pick two artworks that Charlotte Horlake introduces in her chapter, Contesting Form and Content, about contemporary Korean art. Um, and you're going to comparatively describe, describe them, uh, with attention to the similarities and differences in media genres, style, viewer interaction, and comparatively interpret how they relate to the idea of tradition. Are they for or against tradition? What are your reasonings for each? Um, you may want to think, you may want to pick one that you believe is for and one that you believe is against, um, or you can pick two that are both either for or against and discuss how they differently kind of express that position toward um, tradition. And be sure to refer to what Horlick says about these artworks in your um, writing. Do not write about sorry for your suffering. We talked about that in class, so you can't repeat that, okay? All right. Thank you very much. You're dismissed. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, I really appreciate your diligence and your thoughts. Um, if you have questions, stay back and ask me. I just had one quick question, Logan. Yes. Hi, Alpha. So back to back to the whole, I, I know that we move past like tradition, like the word tradition and whatnot, but with the prompt, you're, mm -hmm. you're you know, with the whole is it for, is it against? And then if we mm -hmm. were to con if we were to compare and contrast like Ebers, um uh, performance art and and Sadoho's art. Mm -hmm. we say tradition i feel like there's a there's like a political tie with that because if we looked at Ebor's like abortion piece we compared it to soto's piece we're talking about like a potential a potential tradition that's tied with politics versus soto's piece where it's like oh 